Good evening, everybody. Certainly a pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Wayne Hammond. Um, my background is a clinical psychologist, but I'm also a parent. So everything I'm going to talk to you tonight, I have to practice every day. Uh, and I've got a 14 and a 16 year old. And uh, I keep telling them they're my long term experiment. So when I hit 18, I'm going to ask them how they're doing. <laughs> but <clears throat> my clinical background um, kind of taught me that, you know, when people are experiencing challenges, that we should come alongside and sort of really explain to them how messed up they are and what they're doing wrong, and we tag a label to it. And what I realized in my journey was is that people don't want to be fixed, they want to be valued. When they're valued, they actually value what you have to offer. I started to translate that into my family work, working with families and their parenting processes. Our children <clears throat> are actually amazing. They just don't know it yet. And our job as parents is to help facilitate that process where they start believing in themselves in such a way that they respect themselves, they respect those around them, and they look to you for those decisions around values, what it means to go forward with confidence, what it means to actually go through challenges and not back away from it, but actually learn from those challenges and get better for it. I believe we need to build our children from the inside out, not try to manage risk, not try to manage the outside world because you can't. There's things that our children are going to face, whether it's at school, in the playground, or in the community, or as they move forward in life, that we have no control over. But what you do have control over is building their sense of resilience, their sense of who am I, what's my sense of purpose, what are my strengths. When I face a challenge, do I know how to navigate and negotiate that in ways where I know what success is like? I always tell parents is that the best way to help your children develop those internal qualities is because you have a relationship where they feel valued, that they want that relationship with you, but start messing up your children's lives. Start teaching them how to live outside their comfort zone. Teach them what it means to be part of community, what it means to give back, what it means to be part of something positive. We, the danger we have with our children today is that they're going to be artificially mature based on what they know. They're very intelligent. I walk into schools and I see the teacher doing a lecture at the front of the room and the kid pulling out Google on his app and saying, no, you're wrong. <laughs> they know how to gather information. They know what things know. What they don't know is how to process that information, how to use it in constructive ways. So people will come to me and say, Wayne, how do we teach our kids to handle technology? We're scared of the texting and all these different things out there. Teach them how to have inner values. Kids with inner values and know how to respect others don't misuse texting. They'll use it in constructive ways. So what I want to invite you in today is this idea that we want to build resilience in our children, not smooth out their path. You need to prepare your children for the path that they're going to have to walk. And if we don't, we're setting them up for failure. I just got back from the University of Alabama working with first-year university students. I went into the sororities, you know, the alpha clubs and all that kind of stuff. I saw parents living with their children for the first two weeks there, just to make sure they get settled in. <laughs> There's a sense of entitlement that comes with that. <laughs> and the teachers are feeling it in their first year university. I don't want my two boys to feel a sense of entitlement. I want them to know that what does it mean to be a Hammond? And I'll talk to you about that. I believe there's certain character qualities that you want to start seeing in your children as the result of the way you parent them. Parenting is a very purposeful journey. You can't control tomorrow, but you can control today. The way you talk to them, the way you respond to certain situations, the, the experience you're trying to nurture in, their, in your child, knowing that if you develop those neural pathways, that becomes their default thinking. The way they feel about themselves, the way that they'll go forward in life. It's about developing those patterns, and I'll talk to you a little bit about that. So I'm going to kind of talk about this concept of resilience, a little bit about its implications and some strategies around parenting. I know you received a booklet, and a lot of people are saying, Wayne, when are you going to write a book? Uh, I said, I don't know if I need to add another book to all those things at chapters. Uh, what I did is we actually developed a model where you can actually start that journey with your children, hear their story, guide it, all the strategies you need to do. But anyways, if you want to learn more about it, Sign up, I'll give you a copy of this presentation, so don't worry about writing anything down. 
I'll let you have a copy of it and you can peruse it in your own time. So this is my youngest lad, this is Aaron. You see the look on his face? First five years of school, he hated every day. Every Sunday night, he would literally cry because he had to go to school. One of the reasons for that is that Aaron is an experiential learner. He likes to get out there, mess it up with people. His best subjects at school are definitely recess, lunch, and phys ed. <laughs> He's a social creature. And when somebody comes along and says, I want you to do math and you're gonna sit here for 45 minutes, you might as well like, it just kills him. But then he met Mr. Magnan. And Mr. Magnan says, I understand your son. I know the sparks inside of him because I'm ADHD. I can't sit down and do this kind of stuff either. All of a sudden, Mr. Magnan started to build into my child's life. Things that I couldn't do as a parent, but what he was starting to pick up on was that there's certain things that Aaron does well. And when he created an environment where he could practice it, where he could reach out and do different things, all of a sudden I'm driving home at night and Aaron's sort of saying, did you know this, Dad? Did you know that? Did you know this? All of a sudden there was this light bulb that went on. And I started to realize that what Mr. Magnum was doing was being strength-based with my child. He wasn't trying to control Aaron. He wasn't trying to sort of say, you should be doing this. What he was doing was saying, I understand the strengths of your child. And I'm going to invite him into learning where he knows what to do and how to express it and how to go forward. I could never argue with anything that Mr. Magnus said. If Mr. Magnus said it, it was like God with a small g. It was absolute. But it's interesting how even now, Mr. Magnus still has a relationship with my son. They still have lunch together. Part of parenting is not doing it on your own and I'm gonna show you from the framework. You have to build other people into their lives. I'm really excited about your community project. I do research right across Canada. I've got over 800,000 kids in my data set. The weakest factor is kids reaching out into community. They have no sense of community. We're isolating them. We're not giving them a sense of what it, does it mean to give back to others? What does it mean to be part of something positive? What does it mean to be part of something where you have to make sacrifices to help others out? If you actually don't get your children involved in volunteer work before the age of 12, less than a 95% chance they'll ever do it as an adult. Those values start at a young age. And guess where they learn it from? Us. It's us. Kids don't change their value system because somebody with authority says do this or else. They change their value system because they want to be like the people that are most important to them. And if you want to protect your children from that so-called storm and stress period of teenage years, have that relationship with them. When children value that relationship they have with you, they don't want to disappoint you. They don't. They will side with your value system nine times out of ten over their teenage influences. That's where we build. It's building from the inside out. So when your children come, you're, <laughs> I've got two kids. They're like night and day. I thought I got it worked out with the first one and the second one comes along and all of a sudden I had to revamp my whole parenting strategy. Different personality, different likes. You know, Jared's that He's gonna make an amazing lawyer. Dad, I heard you, I don't think you're right, but I'll think about it and I'll tell you in the morning whether you're right or wrong. Aaron's that experiential learner, right? He goes out and he'll come back and say, Dad, what happens when you eat a ladybug? He's not asking me whether he's going to or not, he already has and he thinks he's gonna die. <laughs> but that's how he learns. So I've gotta be different on how I approach things. But guess what, they don't get to choose you either. You know, and you hear those kids say, you know, Mom and Dad, you don't understand me. You don't get me. And then when they turn 23, they say, it's amazing how much you matured. We didn't change. It was their take on life. This is my other lad. He's now 6'4". And I, I think we've got to stop feeding him is what we really need to do. But both of them are amazing. And right from day one, I just promised myself that I would help them to understand their greatness. I think they're amazing. The thing that oftentimes holds them back is me. It's my fear about what's going to happen. It's my fear that they might not get to certain things. You know, I, I just met with 12 university students. They got their engineering degree in petroleum. Oil dropped to 40. They all sat there paralyzed. I'm not going to have a job tomorrow. I've just wasted four years of my life. And I said, wait a minute, you're smart. <laughs> you did all this amazing stuff at university. How come you can't figure out something here? Eventually you'll get there. But they hadn't learned to adapt. They hadn't learned to step outside their comfort zones. They had a linear view of life. I get a degree, I should get a job. Mm -hmm. 
But guess what, you know, our children, 80% of the jobs out here in 10 to 15 years don't even exist today. We need to create an environment for our children where they know how to take, take certain things, adapt it, and make the best of it. I met with an engineering firm. They have 135,000 35, employees in the world. They no longer hire to skills. They hire to character, resilience. They go through a whole interview process, and 80% of it is, what's your value system? Have you learned to adapt? Are you a team player? Do you want your value? You know, they're looking at those concepts, because he said, Wayne, I can teach a kid anything if they're smart. I can't teach them character. I can't teach them resilience. And that's what's going to be the difference between kids who succeed and kids who don't. As I said, our kids are going to have to make choices. And how are we preparing them? It's about if you get a straight A student going to school, no behaviors. I just finished a study with the Toronto School Board, highest kids for at risk. First year university, highest dropout rate, highest drug rate, highest suicidal ideation rate. Why? Because their whole identity was tied to, I need to be an A plus student and please people. All of a sudden they go to university and they're not the smartest kid in the block. All of a sudden they're having to live with all these different perspectives of life. At my university, I'm an adjunct professor with the School of Medicine, 30% of our students drop out in the first year. This is the cream of the crop across Canada, <laughs> marks-wise, smart-wise but they're not prepared for the challenges that are coming. So I believe it starts with us as parents. How can we start that process where we build them from the inside out? What are the characteristics we're looking for? What are the purposeful experiences we need to start at ages one, two, three, four, five, right up through? Because resiliency is a lifelong journey. It starts when you're born and it ends when you die. But you face different challenges as you go through. And we start at a very young age, right? We have a lot of our kids going to school or in the community environment, and we're starting to say, if you act a certain way, then this is what you are. But if you don't, then this is what you are. And we start labeling people. The challenge of that is that kids will live up to the labels you place on them. They'll start thinking less of who they are because there's an expectation you can only be a certain way. And we do try as parents, right? We do have a history, the way you were parented. What you experience, we're bringing to the game. Now, there is a wisdom you bring, absolutely. It doesn't necessarily mean that the way you were parented is what your children need. So, we have some common goals, and all these goals are appropriate. We do want good things for our children. We want them to be successful. We want them to be able to do amazing things. But, as this says, son, honey, when you grow up, I want you to be assertive, independent, and strong-willed, but while you're a kid, I want you to be passive, pliable, and obedient. <laughs> you don't get that end result. I actually like it when kids push back, because really what they're saying to you is, I'm trying something. We oftentimes see it as you're not listening to me, <laughs> but that's the point. It's not, why are you doing that because I told you not to do that. It's more of, that's an interesting choice. I would never have thought of that. Why is, it, why is it important to you? One's a judgment statement. One's an invitation to explore. Because I believe children are just trying to get through life. And they're just trying what they've learned to date. And if they haven't got all their options figured out, they try certain things that may not fit with where you want them to go. And so you have to help them take a step back, explore, develop new options. And we do face an interesting life as parents, right? I'm right there with you. I'm exhausted some days. I go to work for 10 hours, come home, feed them, do their homework, and then they tell me about how they got in trouble that day. But, you know, the, but the point is, is that if you're trying to manage and sort of have expectations of what they should be like, then it will be a, t a trying job. You will be exhausted uh, because you can't manage that. And as you said, there's stressful situations but I actually want my children to learn that stress is actually a positive. It motivates you. It lets you know that there should maybe be something going on that you should be doing differently. I want my children to be experiencing challenges. Every Friday night, I tell them, what did you learn this week? And really what I'm saying is, did you make a mistake and learn from it? Because if you're not making mistakes, you're not learning. You're playing it safe. You're not doing things. Now you need to be respectful. You need to learn to take smart risks, but you need to be stepping outside your box. So our response oft times, because we do have concern about our parents, we're afraid of what's going to happen in the schoolyard or in the community, 
We have all these different reactions. We're avoidant. We're anxious. We're overly protective, overly involved. Sort of like those university students at Alabama, their parents are a little on the over-involved side. And as a result of that, this is what I believe you create. dealing with your kids sometimes? I'm saying this and you're right here. There's this huge disconnect. I just want to narrow that disconnect, okay? Some of our children are like a palm tree. You know, their personality. And this is Jerry. It drives me nuts. He's laid back. I'll get to it when I get to it, Dad. Yeah, but isn't the test tomorrow? Oh, I'll get around to it. When are you going to get up and study for this? It's 11 o'clock. I'm going to bed. Oh, I'll get up early and do it. You know, it just drives me nuts. Then you got Aaron, he's like the pine tree. Tell him exactly what you expect and it's done. Got that off the list, I'm on to the next thing. But what we're oftentimes trying to do, I believe, is create what we call bonsai children. We want them to act a certain way, dress a certain way, and uh, interact a certain way. But the problem with the bonsai tree is that when you transplant it to new soil, it dies. It doesn't learn to dig its roots deep. It hasn't learned to find out where I need to go for resources. Who do I need to bring into my life? Who should I trust? How should I think about things? What are the value systems that I have? If you don't develop those things in our children, they tend to be followers of other things. They tend to be at risk because, not because they're not great kids, it's just they don't know when to use discernment. They don't know when to reach out or help or step back or show self-regulation. So if we think our children are fragile and broken, they will live a fragile and broken life. If we believe they're strong and wise, they will live with enthusiasm and courage. The way we parent our children strongly influences the way they're going to live. So let's start the journey. And it doesn't mean you have to go back to age two. You can start anytime. I've worked with kids that are 16, totally out of control. Work with them from this perspective, and it's amazing how they start realizing, oh, I'd rather experience success than all this. And it's just a natural assumption I have about all children. They want to be successful, they want to be part of something positive, and they want to give back. If you create that environment, they respond to it. And it starts in our families. So we do have a choice. So we can sit on the escalator or wait for somebody else to rescue us. And I think it just starts with us because we're the most profound influence in our children's lives. So what is our goal? Our goal is not to raise perfect children who have no worries, to safeguard them from every possible loss, heartache, and danger. Rather, our goal should be to raise strong children who can handle the bumps and bruises that the world inevitably has in store for them. Our goal is resilience, not invulnerability. 
And so understanding that and knowing how to do that and how to build that, I believe, is one of the purposefulnesses of being a parent. So you could look at the young child here and say, you're a delinquent or you're an entrepreneur, just how you look at it. And I believe one of the strategies that we have to stay away from is GPS parenting. What I mean by that is that you're listening to other people's instructions of what you're doing. Have you ever put a G an address into a GPS on your car or whatever and you find out the path it takes you on? It's kind of like, why am I here and did I get there? You, you have no control over it. I believe that the parenting style you need to have is more of a journey. Every day you have something to explore. You're interacting. It's organic. It's how you invite creativity. It's how you explore things. It's when you watch your children, you're looking. You're listening to how they respond to things. My son was playing basketball. <clears throat> this goes back about four years ago. And one of the major concepts that I have with my children is that uh, if you value yourself, you should be valuing others. And that means when you're playing sports or anything like that, you step up to the plate. Uh, when your colleagues are needing it or you need to step up and do the right thing. I wasn't sure exactly whether my son was that. So what I'm looking for is those opportunities when I see it. Because when you see these opportunities of success, you should be identifying it with your children all the time. I liked when you did this. When you did that, that was amazing. I liked the way that you persevered because you did this, this, and this, and you got there. If we just praise our children, so what? Identify what they did to get to what you wanted them to do because when they see it, they'll repeat it. They start to understand things. And so when Aaron was out on the basketball floor, he saw some of his classmates starting to get teased because we have a small school and we have a lot of special needs kids and some of them are on the basketball team. And other teams were starting to identify that these kids were just not fully with the game. And it was really interesting how Aaron went up to the coach and said, you need to stop that. These are my friends. We're part of a team. Nobody told him to do that. I expect it because that's what I was trying to build into him. And after, to go up to him and say thanks. That was amazing, son. You stood up for something, and that means something to me. It's really interesting because now Aaron's trying to teach that to the twos and threes and fours at school. He passes on the legacy because he's developed it as a value system. It was something that I was trying to nurture, but when I saw it, I identified it. I solidified it and said, thanks, son. That's what it means to be a hammer. So part of this journey is you're going to have kids that are at different stages. They're confused. They got lots of things going on and their brains, especially during that 10, 11, 12, 13, because really what's going on is there a flooding going on. All their hormones are starting to kick into gear and everything you taught them kind of goes by the wayside real quick. It re-solidifies itself. But part of this comes from our research in brain uh, and, and neurology. When kids are born, by the time they reach age six, 95% of their physical brain is developed. And we kind of thought as psychologists and medical field that they actually had the ability to do a lot of amazing things. And we realized that we're actually wrong. Because we were doing MRI research and kind of monitoring the brain activity. And what we found out was is that kids the corpus callosum, which brings the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere, their ability to show reasoning, their show, the ability to show empathy, to understand what raw emotions are and how to express them. And then the prefrontal cortex, which is the seat of civilization, it's that logic. To understand that other people have feelings, that I can actually work through things, actually isn't fully developed in children until age 29. So when your child is doing something and you come along say, and say, I told you yesterday, how come you're not listening to me? It means their neurons aren't firing. They're not a bad kid. And if you say, go to your room, what you've done is you've written a neural pathway that says, if I behave a certain way, my mom and dad like me. But only if I behave a certain way. We move away from that unconditional, you're my son, that never changes. I don't always agree with what you say. But what we need to do at that point is say, oh, I get it. That's not something you're comfortable with yet. We're going to repeat it. We're going to repeat it. And eventually, you will write the neural pathway for that and, and, and bring it together. So starting to understand where your children are at, especially younger children, because boys have a flooding of the brain when they're actually born. That's why you'll see with boys that they kind of seem emotionally immature compared to girls for a good period of time. And our brain shrinks at birth. 
We're off to a bad start right from the get-go. I always use that with my wife. <laughs> I'm a delayed, exceptional needs person. But Brentro kind of brings some wisdom to this. When you're working with your children, don't focus on trying to control their behavior. Help them to identify how they're feeling. When they're angry, they think a certain way, therefore behave a certain way. If you try to control the behavior, I can modify behavior any day. I can put enough consequences in place that a child will stop doing something. Doesn't mean I help them to learn how to regulate their feeling. If they're angry, help them to know how to move from angry to calmness, because that changes their thinking, which introduces the opportunity for a different behavior. So the art of strength-based parenting is not always controlling behavior unless it's risk, but learn the art of hearing story. Listen to the feeling. Understand, I get it, you were angry. Your sister was teasing you. I don't agree that you hit her, but I get it. You were frustrated. What would it look like if you weren't frustrated? What would she need to be doing to help you with that? Then you're starting to calm them down. Because the brain's an interesting thing. If they're anxious and you're coming after them, there's this primitive part of our brain that just goes like this. You're wasting your breath at that point because they're in fight, flight, freeze thing. You've got to calm them down. It opens it up. Then you can have the conversation. If, you, if your child is feeling anxious, is feeling like you're coming down on me, etc., you can't have a conversation with them. You've got to get into a situation where they're calmed up because that part of the brain opens up. Then they listen to it. They actually understand that you're trying to perceive them. So that idea of yelling at your child, that's what happens. It goes like this. And the other part is, I know you're frustrated. You need to take a break, or we need to take a break. We'll come back and talk about this in three minutes. Watch that open up again. All of a sudden, then, when you interact, you're building something. So he talks about this idea that we need to stop focusing on behavior, although we need to know that behavior is happening as a result of what we're doing, but focus on the feeling, the emotion. That changes the thinking. Behavior follows. So the challenge, do we prepare our children to survive? And a lot of our kids are just surviving. They're out there trying to make it. They're trying to fit into their peer group. They're trying to fit into the, the with it clubs at school or environments. Rather, I believe we need to prepare our children to thrive. That they have a sense of who they are, they have a sense of purpose, they have these skill sets, they understand what their strengths are because you've been nurturing it experientially through the years of their parenting. So when they start hitting 16, 17, you know, you've moved from a teacher to a facilitator to a mentor. By that time, children should be taking ownership of a lot that they're doing and using you as a sounding board of how things are working, drawing upon your wisdom. So the definition of resilience, and this is where I moved in my research, was I wanted to understand what was it that we needed to focus on in our parenting journey or in education, et cetera. What are those factors that if we understand them and we can nurture this in our children, that they actually present with this thriving mentality, this growth mindset. And so a lot of people see resilience as this, my kids bounce back from a tough situation. They were bullied at school, but they're doing okay. They failed a class, they're doing okay. They got hit, they're doing okay. Now bully, resilience is more than that. Resilience is really a self-writing concept. It's that child developing a stronger and stronger sense of who they are in different contexts and how those relationships around them are nurturing or cheerleading that growth in them. And it, a dynamic process going back and forth over their journey. And so a lot of the kids, you know, they go to school, they'll start picking out certain teachers. That teacher, teacher builds into my life or that community member builds into my life. And they're continuing that process. So it's an interactive process, not a, oh, my kid's okay, so they should do well in life. You're wanting to nurture it at every stage. So every day, every week, every month, always be listening. What are the criteria you're looking for to see your child developing these qualities? Now, this is a, a short video of a guy who I think is probably one of the most resilient people I've ever married um, or, or seen. Um, uh, he's now married, has his own family. Uh, he's, he's an amazing person. <laughs> Young Hassel. My name is Ning Vujicic and I love traveling around the world, fishing, golfing and swimming. I love living life. I am happy. Like it was pointless. There's no point. 
point to my life, there's no point to go to school. I didn't think I was even going to be able to go to university, you know. And, and they, uh, cold, I don't, know, I don't know how to describe it, but it's like bitterness as well. Um, some of my staff know uh, Nick or have met him. I met him once. Um, he, he just, you know, he's one of those guys, hey, can I take a picture with you, Nick? And he says, are you ready? And I says, ready for what? And he jumps up into your arms. <laughs> but Nick talked about the whole idea that when he was growing up, it was his parents that had the most profound influence in his life because everybody was perceiving him as disabled and incredibly vulnerable. And he says it was his parents who said, no, you're going to have to learn to thrive in life. You're going to have to go forward. And they built into that. Teachers built into his life. Other community members built into his life. And he's on a speaking circuit. Like, he's presenting like 150 to 160 times a year. He's traveling the world. He is just amazingly turning kids' lives upside down. But who would have thought of that when he was in the elementary years, etc.? He definitely talked about there's days when I didn't believe in myself, when my parents had to, teachers had to. But it was that dynamic process of resilience, how Nick was developing a sense of who he was, what his strengths were, how he could draw upon them, and how people were giving him an opportunity to explore that and to try that. And so that's that concept of resilience, and he's a living example of it. So in the research that I do, we came down and found that there's four areas that those relationships tend to come from. One is family, one's community. School is a profound influence. And then there's the peer group. These is where kids reach out to. This is where they connect. And then there's that inner circle, and that's how kids think about themselves. And what I realized in my work is that it doesn't matter what I think about my two boys. What they think about themselves is everything. Because that's the lens they look through. That's how they respond to the world around there. And so my job is not to impose my perspective of how I see them on. 
help them to nurture theirs because that's the lens they're gonna take on life with. And so we developed this model and I'll just quickly show you, but you can see as a family, you have a number of factors that are very important. The way you communicate with your children, the way they feel safe with you, the way they feel cared for, how they feel, whether you're involved in their lives, do you take an interest, are you going to school, etc. And then you see peer influence, and you can notice peer influence is the least influential of all the factors. Again, it goes back to that fact that if children have adult, lives, or adult relationships with people they value, nine times out of 10, they'll side with the adult values, not their peers. Then you can see school is incredibly important. It's around 40% of the factor. Why? Because teachers spend more time with their kids than we do. They, the way they talk, the way they inspire them to learn, the way they interact with them. So those relations are, that's why it's so important for you to get involved in school, to know who the teachers are that are part of your children's lives, to share your story of how you see your child learning, the way that they respond to things, so that your teacher can support that in the classroom, in the hallways, etc. And then community is the other factor, and that's why I'm so excited about what you're doing here. We need to get our, involved, our kids involved in community, and the group of kids back there doing the water program, good on you. That's exactly what you need to be doing. You're changing the world because you value something more than just yourselves. That's how we deal with entitlement, guys. You wanna deal with your children's entitlement? Get them serving other people. Get them at whatever it is, working on food lines at the food bank, helping out, and not every Christmas. Once a month, make it a ritual, part of your family, your value system. And then I was taking a look at how the kids think about themselves, their self-esteem, their self-efficacy, their value system, their spirituality. And I don't mean just faith. I mean, where do our children get a sense of purpose? What am I, what's my destiny? What, what drives me? What puts a spark on my face? And then I talk about, you know, accepting other people with different belief systems. I talk about, do you know how to show empathy? Do you know how to show caring? Do you have a sense of right and wrong? Do you know what's good for you? Can you say no to it uh, if it's bad? Uh, you're problem solving, etc. So these are internal traits. And what's important about this is that the way we design this tool is that the child fills the questionnaire out. It's their story. And it's amazing sometimes you'll see things that you never thought of. Or I thought we had that kind of and you're not quite there yet. Okay, I need to. So it's not a right or wrong, it just means that's their story. And what you need to know is what do you, what do you see as a strength and I'm gonna stretch that? And what is it that you're not quite sure about and I'm gonna build that? And so you're constantly sort of saying, I've got a framework now. Before as a parent, I was kind of hit and miss. I was, if I saw a problem, I stepped in and we dealt with it. If everything was cool, good, we must be good parents. And I'm starting to realize that sometimes being cool or thinking everything's fine is we're actually setting our children up for failure because we're not touching on the right things. So why is resiliency important? And I, I'll just show you a few charts. I could give you thousands of charts. But that outer circle and inner circle has 31 traits. So when kids come to me and say, Wayne, I've only got five of those that I understand, they're at risk for almost eight out of 14 risk factors. So we were measuring drug use, skipping school, bullying, oppositional behavior, uh, breaking property just for the fun of it, concepts like that. Uh, language, inappropriate language, concepts like that. You can see as the resiliency increases, and so the kids were saying, I've got more strengths, their engagement and risk goes down dramatically. We use 20 as a cutoff to sort of say positive resiliency versus maybe more challenging resiliency. And even kids who are resilient said, Wayne, I engaged in some risk. I tried smoking, but I let it go. I pushed that guy, I'm now his friend. What happens is that when they engage in risk, they know what to do with it. They actually make it right. They have this internal value system that says, wait a minute, I tried that, but it wasn't right, so I'm gonna do something about it. That's what I want in my children. I don't want them to be perfect. I want them, when you face something, do you know what to do with it? Whereas the kid who had the low resiliency, they're just trying to survive. I tried it, it met my immediate need, and I'm not thinking of the long-term consequences or what it's influencing around me. So marijuana use. Low resiliency. 52% of those kids would smoke drugs on a regular basis. Why? Because they don't value themselves. They're looking for ways to cope. They're not handling stress well. As the resiliency goes up, you can see it go down. Now, I did a study out in Souk, BC, and it was 40% right across the board. It didn't seem that degree of resiliency changed the risk behavior. And I thought, you blew my theory right out of the water. But I met with the parents after, and they said, Wayne, we get this. We smoke marijuana with our kids. Okay. 
<laughs> Do you get the value system coming down from adults to kids? <laughs> They said, well, if my mom and dad do it, then it's not wrong. They didn't perceive it as wrong. So your children do watch. Uh, doesn't mean you have to be perfect. Just admit it when you mess up, right? And then you're teaching your children what it means to be human. You want to deal with bullying? You want to bully-proof your kid? Make them resilient. Because guess what? Your child's going to get bumped in the hallway. Somebody's going to look at them the wrong way. Somebody's going to swear at them. It's going to happen. I just need to know that my child says, that's okay, that's your opinion, doesn't define who I am, and on with life. We did this in the school system, and this, th these kids, they had a betting club. Every Thursday, this is grades six, seven, and eight, here in Calgary, they had a betting club. Every kid received a number. Two numbers were drawn, those two kids had to fight out in the, out in, uh, the schoolyard on Friday. Yeah. And the other kid would bet on it. We had a tough time controlling that. Well, it is, we came in and taught kids, what does it mean to be respected? What does it mean to have relationships? Build the resiliency. We haven't had to touch that dial for four years. We don't even bring bullying programs into the school because the kids say, we know what to do with that, Wayne. We have a culture of respect here. We have a model that we respect each other. We value each other. So why would we bully anybody? Because that's our new value system. So it's really interesting how they're owning the process because we're building from the inside out not trying to put regulations, or a teacher standing in the hallway to stop people from doing it. I want the kids to say, we don't do that. Matter of fact, when somebody new comes to that school, the model in the school is they will have five friends within four hours. Somebody comes in, kids are gravitating to them, immediately saying, I'm gonna be your friend. I will make sure that you're valued and you will be part of our school. That's the concept that we're playing with. The opposite pattern is low resiliency, 2.4 out of 14 pro-social behaviors. So healthy eating, positive mental health, uh, attending school, uh, respect to parents, good communication skills. As the resiliency goes up, it just exponentially goes up. So the model that I'm trying to work with people around, don't control risk, build resiliency. Risk becomes less of an option. And if they do engage it, they know what to do with it or they'll reach out to the adults in their lives to navigate it in a very different way. So that's about preparing your children for life. And as you go through the early years, to the middle years, to the tween years, or the teenage years, stressors will always be there. They're going to be faced with decisions, other people's expectations of them. And what I'm trying to do with my two boys is you define who you are. If you make a mistake, that's fine. What defines you is what you do with it. How people treat you is, well, oftentimes, who you choose to allow into your life. How do you set those boundaries? But then, what are you doing? How are you part of a solution? So a strength-based parenting approach is we focus on what's strong, not, to what, not what's wrong. Focus on what your children do well. You should have an 80-20 rule. You should be identifying things more often that your children are doing right than what they're not doing. Because they learn from you identifying it, and they'll want to repeat it because they want to please you. There is a natural tendency for that. But if they don't know how to do that, or if they feel like they make a mistake and you're gonna jump all over them, they'll become fearful. And they won't take chances. Or they won't behave certain ways in front of you, but they'll do it behind you. And that's not what you want. Focus on preparing children to walk the path. Again, you're kind of getting that sense from me is that life is a journey. And really what you're doing is equipping your children with these basic skill sets of how they think about themselves and the strengths around them. Focus on promoting learning from mistakes. Focus more on what's right and why it's right. Identify the process. I liked it when you got on that bike and you started pedaling because when you pedaled hard, you straightened out. And you could have fallen, but you persevered. You kept going. Good for you. What you do? You taught them a number of really neat things. You took a smart risk. You persevered. You showed grit. And you followed through on what you said you were going to do. All those factors led to success. Good for you. Focus on what the children are becoming, not what they're going to be. Every day, I look for those opportunities to listen to my child's heart. What's going on? So I ask different questions. Now, how did you do school today? Because you, you know what you're gonna get for an answer, right? Fine. Keep on walking. I'll ask questions of, who taught you something today? What did you influence today? What was important to you that you learned that's changed your life today? I'm looking for things that are processes, things that are inside. 
And I started at a young age. Like, you don't have to wait until they're 18 to have those questions. I work with parents around, what does it mean to ask a five-year-old? Your opinion counts. I'm excited that you do certain things. Why did you draw that flower that way? Sounds like something kind of caught your interest. Or if you're wanting them to know how, how do you feel today, draw a picture of a flower for me. And if it's sad, whatever, what would it look like if it was like this? There's different ways to get to those feelings and emotions that are age appropriate. But have the conversations. Children just need to know you're interested in who they are, what they feel, and that you respond to it. And focus on nurturing optimism and growth mindset. A colleague of mine, Marty Sligman the States, written a book on the optimistic child. It's a great book to read. He says, the worst thing we've got going in our society is our children don't feel hopeful about the future. They're scared. They're not optimistic. They don't think that they're actually going to be able to live up to their parents' expectations or have a lifestyle in many ways that their parents are offering. And that's not a good starting point for our kids. I need to know that the more chaotic the world gets, my children think it's exciting. Because chaos is an opportunity for change. It's an opportunity for something different. So stages of parenting, when your children are younger, you're definitely a teacher. You're teaching them those concepts. You're teaching them right and wrong. You're teaching them what it means to be fair. All those concepts. But when they hit those middle years, 12 to 17, you're now a facilitator. And this is usually the biggest transition that parents have because when they're, you're a teacher, they listen to you. Then they turn to that 11, 12, 13 range, and all of a sudden they got their own opinion. And they don't always agree with you. And they kind of challenge you a little bit. And you're saying, yeah, but they never talked back to me before like that. It, it, all of a sudden, it's not that that's a bad thing. That's actually very important that they go through that. They have to go through what I call a crisis of faith or a crisis of identity. They have to start questioning why you think about things and what is important to them. Because if they don't internalize that value system, they won't own it. They won't know how to practice it and draw upon it. So you want them to kind of go through it. You just need to know that if you have that amazing relationship with them and you've nurtured that quality in them, they eventually will oftentimes side with your value system going forward. They'll adopt it, but then they've owned it, not because you said it was important, they own it because they think it's important. And then it starts to become something that guides their path. And then during their latter years, you're a coach. They're trying things. You need to act like a sounding board. Interesting choice, let's see how it works out for you. Let's talk about it. So, I am is how kids are thinking about themselves. I have are this. Now this is the parenting strategies. I can becomes a natural byproduct of it. So key to bringing these two together is your parenting strategies as a parent. So again, the idea is stack the desk, uh, deck against risk. The idea is the clarity to work together to create an ecology around children and youth that makes it increasingly difficult for certain high problems to survive. Now, one of the things that came out in our research that is really fascinating, if you take this approach of listening to your child, building, and I'll talk about some of the strategies, they start developing these core copies of character. This is what I mean when I say, what does it mean to be a Hammond? Guess what? This is what three of the major corporations downtown are now 50% of their hiring process. They're measuring these concepts in the new employees. This is what school boards are starting to move towards. They're starting to realize that we need to have as a mandate in education, character plus learning to learn. Because if we don't bring these two concepts together, we haven't prepared kids. So when you start, one of the byproducts that I'm looking for all the time in my children is, are they developing positive social skills? Do they know who their friends are? Who's their outer circle? Who's their inner circle? Who are those people that influence their value system? I'm interested in, are they able to cope with stress? Do they know how to navigate? Are they able to be good with things? So my son comes home, didn't make the basketball team last year absolutely tore him up because basketball was his life. He's the guy that likes recess and phys ed. My natural tendency as a parent is to come in and rescue him. Oh, that's okay. We'll get you over here. We'll let you play community ball, etc. I had to take a step back and say, you know something? That sucks. That hurts, doesn't it? I know it. I can see it on your face. I'm not too sure what you're going to do about this, but I want to see. But let's talk about it tomorrow. It's really fascinating. He went to school the next day and said, Dad, I'm gonna I asked the coach if I could continue practicing with the team. And I just want to go and cheerlead my team members on next year. But if I practice hard, I'll get on next year. 
So it wasn't my job to come in and rescue him. My job was to give him permission to work through that in a safe caring environment. But did he figure it out? Did he actually find a solution to it that he could work through? That's what you're looking for. That's called positive coping. Positive adaptability. Do they know how to learn from their mistakes? I want my children to make mistakes. Not that put them at risk, but make mistakes, but own it. Learn how to uh, do something different as a result of doing that mistake. Positive determination, that's that grit factor. I'm looking for perseverance. If you try something, you need to continue with it. We have a lot of times, you know, we sign our kids up for activities and they don't like it and we let them quit. No, if you signed up for something, you should go the distance with it. You can make a choice at the end, but no, you signed up for this. So we need to do this. So that concept of perseverance, and we're starting to see that that actually has huge benefits in learning and skills at school. Writing tests, preparing for exams, perseverance is a key factor for success at school. And then positive group membership, this idea of belonging to community, belonging to something positive, giving to others. And then positive values. We have to help our children develop a sense of right and wrong. There is a basic sense of right and wrong in our society. The way we treat people, the way that we work together, that when we step in, that's that concept in schools around bullying. If it happens, I'm not a bystander, I step in because that's not what happens at our school. That's not what happens to my friends. We need to help our kids step up to that. Um, emotional awareness. Kids need to realize that it's okay to be angry. It's what you do with the feeling that's important. You have a spectrum of feelings. It's okay to experience in them, but develop self-regulation, develop positive ways to express it. And that positive spark. Are you teaching your kids? What puts a smile on their face? For Aaron, it's animals. He's got a better relationship with our dog than most of his friends because he loves this animal. He cares about it. You know, when he, he can't watch shows where animals are at risk or hurt in any way, I, I, any money, that's, he's going to become a vet or he's going to become something that's tied to that. Oftentimes, the sparks that your children gravitate to determine where they go in life and who they tend to associate with. Nurture it. Give them a chance to explore it. And then positive value awareness is that spiritualness, that sense of what's your sense of purpose, what gives you a sense of values. Tie your kids to great organizations, whether it's in community, your faith, scouts, girl guides, whatever it is, get them involved in things that teach them values. So developing that growth mindset, if you listen to these questions, do you see one judgment statement in it? But every one of them opens up a door. So when I'm working with kids, I tell them, you're an important part of our family. And why you're important? Because you do this and nobody else can do it. I like the way you handled that. Now, I wouldn't have done it that way. I could have stepped in and said, this is what you do, son, da 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 da, da. No, I stepped back and said, I liked what you did. I wonder how we could do it again tomorrow. These are all ways to start inviting that concept of I value you, that's my starting point, and I want to hear how you're doing things. So strength-based parenting. You, you got that, right? <laughs> your job is to connect with your children. As you connect, they should feel inspired about who they are, what they think they can do, that sense of hope and optimism. You need to be facilitating a relationship and experiences so at the end of it, they're empowered. It's them believing. It's your child's job is to reflect. What, are, what the heck is mom and dad doing? Uh, explore it, experience it, and then thrive. So that's the, the, the template you're going through. So here's the principles that I practice. I have an absolute belief that both my boys have potential. And if I focus on their strengths, that's what's going to get them towards their goals in life, not what they do wrong. We can explore options, but they need to understand what their strengths are. I need to focus on islands of competence. My children don't know what their strengths were. They do now, why? Because I pointed it out. When they were five, 10, 15, I was always looking for, that's amazing. I like what you did there. They now know that because I pointed it out. Most kids don't know that. Don't expect your children just to be amazing through passiveness. They need you in their lives pointing it out. Knowing that you need to choose your opportunities. You need to pick and choose your battles. Sometimes you're doing things with your children because it's convenient for you, or you want something done, or it's, no. Sometimes there's battles you need to step into. Other things, it's okay for your children to try different things. It may not the way you did it, 
but give them permission to explore. Understanding that change is inevitable. Our children have an innate desire to succeed and be their own person. It's, as I said, they're going through things that you and I will never experience. Positive change always occurs when they know we care for them and that we will be there unconditionally. Both my boys know that they are my sons. That's non-negotiable. Every night, even my 16-year-old still calls me. I go to the room and I say, how was your day? I really like you being in my family. I like the way you handle yourself. How was your day? That's usually when we have our most important conversations. Aaron's a little different. He likes to get up in the morning and have breakfast with me. We talk then. But both of them know that they are my children and that that one, I don't always agree with what they do. They know that too, <laughs> very clearly. But they know that I will never talk to them in a way that they feel disowned or they feel degraded. I will always challenge the behavior in a way that says, let's explore other options. I'm not sure that was where you wanted to go to. Positive change. Um, understanding our children's perspective, you've got to learn the art of walking in their shoes. What does it mean to show empathy? What does it mean to ask different questions? You were frustrated, angry. Yeah, I get it. Um, what can we do with that? And children feel more confident in the future when you start with what they already know and can do. If you're asking your children to change, start with something they already know how to do. Use that as your starting point to try to go to something different. We're oftentimes asking them to do things that they have no clue. They don't understand, but you're just doing it because you have an experience. You've got 20, 30, 40 years, and you know how to get there, and you're just making the assumption they should. Now, go back and just start with the small things. Scaffold success. And strength-based parenting is a process. It's a lifelong journey. Realize that what you're starting today is you're building for tomorrow at steps and going forward. So some of the strategies, I always turn problems into learning opportunities. When my kids push the limits, it's an amazing opportunity for me to get together with them. So when my kids did things, I didn't send them to the room. I said, you need to spend the whole morning with me. And by the way, I'm cleaning the garage, and I'm helping mom paint a wall, and we're doing this. <laughs> it was really fascinating. Over time, my children started to say, we're not messing up because we have to spend time with you. <laughs> we started to laugh about it. But it's amazing the conversations I have with my children when we're painting a wall. I don't have to sit them down and try to pull it out of them. It's interesting how they'll say, hey, Dad, this happened to me at school the other day. It's in those casual interactions you'll find the most important conversations come up. Provide a purposeful and empathetic relationship. A person like me really needs a parent, not a friend. They need somebody who's going to come along and say, I'm really interested in you. Uh, you're important to me. Learn to change your scripts and increase doses of nourishment. If you're working with your kids and you're having to explain it at least once over or even three times, you're wasting your breath. It probably means they don't understand or they're not getting it. Your job is to step back. It's not your child's. You need to reword it or come at it a different direction so that they get it. So learn the art of stepping back. Change your script when it's not working. Don't crowd, accept me for who I am. Sometimes you want it to happen. I need to talk to you now. We're going to resolve it. They're not in the space right now. Take a step out, let them know you're gonna to come to it, but you'll get to it. But it doesn't mean that they don't care, they're not interested, it just means that there's too many emotions going on and they're not ready to have that conversation. But don't avoid it. I always use the back door. I'm, I'm not a big believer, unless it's a dangerous thing or really important, coming after your child, always look for opportunities to bring that conversation up. So there might be something I wanna to talk to them, but I'll go to A and B first, I'll eventually get to C. Come in through the back door, uh, start a conversation, and then very uniquely bring the topic up. <laughs> hey, I heard this was happening at school. What happened there? Be authoritative, but not authoritarian. You know, kids need regulations. We know that kids need you to be clear about your expectations, what you're expecting of them. They need to hear it over and over again. This clarity brings a good response but give them choices within. The whole idea of them developing responsibility is them demonstrating to you that they can handle good choices. Then you give them more freedom. And over time, you can sort of broaden that spectrum, but give them an opportunity to show them, show you that they've earned that responsibility and model respect and compassion. So enlist your child to help others. That's that idea of giving away. I touch in small ways. With both my boys, I always affirm them every day. 
I always look for something that says, I, I like what you did there. Thanks for helping my mom with the dishes. Thanks for doing your homework the way you did because boy, I can see that you're listening to your teacher and you want to get things done right. I'm looking for things that I just want to let them know that I'm watching them, that I'm affirming that. I like the way you drew that picture when they're younger. Man, it's so expressive. I can't draw like that. Where did you get that talent? Are you really our child? Just have fun with them around those concepts. Give seeds time to grow. I know you want them to be the way they should be tomorrow, but guess what? It takes time. Scaffold the experience. You'll get there. Eventually, they'll start responding. They'll eventually start demonstrating this behavior. And connect your child to cultural, spiritual roots. Again, that's that idea. Get them involved in things. Um, I just believe that parenting you can't do by yourself. You need other adults in your child's life. Just make sure who they are, what their values are, and how they're building into your child's life. Because they learn things that we can't teach them. That phys ed coach, that teacher at school, the person at the church, the person in the community, the lady that's running the water program is building into every one of those young people's lives in an amazing way. So, I look at these questions. I keep these in the back of the mind. I actually do this when I'm doing therapy. I, these are the same questions I ask. Uh, because I want to know, am I on track with my children? Am I providing the right opportunities? Am I being responsible? I can't control what my children do, but I can control what I do. And therefore, it's important to me that I treat them like a million dollars, that I give them opportunities to grow, that I teach them that I believe in them, and I give them permission to make mistakes and learn from it and be there and cheerlead them. Eventually, they have to own it. If they're not owning the process, your children are at risk. They need to develop that internal sense of, hey, I am an amazing person, not in an arrogant way, but I am a person of value. Why? Because my parents said so, treated me with that way, and taught me how to experience it. Um, just in closing here, I just want to play this video. To me, it's an analogy of exactly what we do as parents. This is what we need to prepare them for, and this is the experience that every one of our children are probably going to have.
Derek, uh, I think, in many ways, represents our children. Every one of your children was designed to run a race. They're built for it. And when you start that process, watch them start to run. But every one of your children is going to fall. They're going to stumble. Something's going to happen. Whatever it is, I just need to know that one of my, <clears throat> my two boys are going to get up. They're not going to lay on the ground. They're not going to accept other people saying, it's okay, woe is you. You can step out of the race. I want them to know, no, I was designed to run. And I need to get up and keep going. But like Derek, oftentimes our children need somebody to come alongside. And we as parents are usually the first people, but there's other people. We need to come along and cheerlead them, not to rescue them, but to help them to continue the journey that they're on. And in this story here, Derek's father let him go. At some point, you're going to have to let your children go. Have you prepared them? Are they going to be able to go out and transform the world in the way you've raised them? We don't have an economic crisis in our world today. We have a crisis of character, a crisis of ethics. We need a generation of youth that are going to go out there and say, you know something? I know who I am. I know what it means to be that amazing teacher in the classroom, that person running the business, that person leading our cities. That's the generation of youth that we need to create. Who got the standing ovation? It wasn't the guy that won the race. It was Derek. Because people recognize greatness. They're grown, they gravitate to it. When your children understand that and know how to draw upon it, that's what they attract into their lives. The type of friends, the type of people, the other people, because they want your children to be successful. It's sort of a contagion. But in many ways, resiliency is sort of like an inoculation. We need to inoculate our children because there's lots of things out there that are going to take them down. But if they're inoculated, they do just fine. And so resiliency, in many ways, is a journey. You all have the amazing ability to build this into your children, but it's a purposeful journey. That's why I'll never probably write a book, because I don't want to tell people what to do. What I want you to do is to enter your own journey, to be guided, to try it. And that's why I actually took a very uh, 15 years of research and put it into a tool and says, no, you're the person that's going to influence your children. You need to hear their story, but I'll give you suggestions of how to play with that, how to explore it. And by the way, your children will do just amazing things. So your children are great. They just don't know it yet. It's your job to help them to understand it. And um, I just want to thank you for the privilege of coming and spending some time with you. Uh, because I think parenting is an amazing job. It's, it takes courage, but it's not for cowards. Thanks very much.